want to briefly make one uh, statement. What you have witnessed, because this is the end of a chapter, and chapter of the life of uh, Santiago, is a purely uh, Cartesian approach. So you start, the card says, you start with a question. What is the question? The question is, briefly, how, given that we preserve the stability of the structure, how we minimize the material. I exaggerate in that, because sometimes you improve also the behavior. But in general, I understand that the behavior is stable, but the material is better and better treated. Then, you, the big question is, what for? Then comes the second Cartesian step, divide and conquer. You cut the parts of the bridge, you articulate it, and you say, why should it be like that? Out of that comes the next step, which is breaking down the possibilities. Now we go back to the combinatorics. It's a kind of very simple combinatorics, which is you put it up or you put it down, you put it left or you put it roughly, it is like that. And uh, then you develop all of a sudden a emergent form. It is emergent. And for those who have no idea how all this thinking is worked out, you think that there is a miracle, you know. All of a sudden, it went puff, while in fact, at least in those cases, we see a very classic, analytical, 100% Cartesian approach. The concluding point also to see is that all those examples deal with what is called the pre-parametric aspect of the solution. In other words, the general scheme. There are no minute calculations to optimize, with the exception of some references you made where you decide what shape, you know, the, uh, this articulated uh, point is going to have. Uh, the fundamentally, all the solutions are simply done through uh, a combinatorics of the divided element. I think it's, uh, uh, you see, the difference between the project I will show you uh, in a very rough uh, and short manner, and, uh, and uh, the previous one is the, the character of the exercise. The one exercise was very free, free in terms of choosing almost the place and saying, you know, this is the way how I want to do. But once you get related to the real reality of having to do something in a place, I, I have to say you pay an enormous attention to the, to the place and also the, you, you have to work not only with the technical problems you have to, uh, uh, to, to be confronted because the, the technical problem is not yet put, but more than anything else you have to deal with the pre-existing situation and try to do the best of this what you have. And uh, I will, uh, in a very um, uh, uh, short way, explain you my approach in, here in, in, into this bridge of uh, uh, Caballeros in Lerida. First of all, you see, you can imagine the city of Lerida is a bit, you know, built in a, in a hill. And then this is the river here. And then there are trees on the other side of the river. So the city is a historical city. There is a street extramuros built afterwards on the riverbed. And the problem was to build a bridge from here into the three areas. And I thought, first of all, I would like to do it asymmetric because the situation is clearly asymmetric. I will not give you too many explanations. You see, I will just keep very synthetic to the thing. And then imagine, for example, we say, okay, I do a, a very light bridge. I use a pylon here, uh, uh, and then I put my deck there and then I have my cables like that, and I anchor it back here. First of all, I couldn't anchor it back because it, this was the walls of the city. Second, to do a very tall pylon is a very difficult thing uh, in, in, in a city who has a rather shallow profile. And so I thought that it could be short like that by inclining the pylon and avoid the problem of getting uh, uh, anchored there by anchoring in the border of the river and having just one leg touching the river. So this delivers a shape who basically appears to be like that, with a head, with a deck, with ramps and decide to descend into the 
uh, river promenade and by having the cables here. Remark that uh, un anchoring the cables here behind and having the border of the river here and the riverbed there. Now, interesting is that, you know, if I has had, let's say, the vertical pylon here, my cable will rise up, you see, much higher. Second, that I could use the weight of the whole wall here, retaining wall, to compensate the pulling force up, and I could create, uh, through the distribution of the cables in the back side of the, of the pylon, a kind of shape. And this is more than anything else to disoriented you all, you know, who could be maybe associated to the shape you can get, you see, in a... where the cables, in a music instrument, where the cables arrive into the so-called It's just to give you the idea that even those thoughts can have a place in, in, a, in a bridge. <laughs> and so here also another uh, bridge in a very beautiful landscape. Something very important, in my opinion, and who is growing. I want just to lose some words because we are in a school and it's important, I think, that the students hear that. Is the importance of the landscape. We are growing into a situation in which we learn, you know, from the 50s and the 60s to, uh, to, to to understand the cultural value of buildings. We have to learn to understand the cultural value of landscapes. You see, if somebody goes to uh, Aix-en-Provence, you see, and see the Saint-Victoire, it's undissociable of the paintings of Cézanne. You understand? So it's not that Cézanne has done a monument of La Saint-Victoire, it is that La Saint-Victoire has been all over a monument, you see, during generations and generations of people, uh, uh, of people who settle around. So it's very important that we understand the cultural value of the landscape. Here I am building in a very high cultural value landscape, which it is a river Guadiana getting through Merida. Merida was called Augusta Emerita, was a, one of the largest Roman cities. Indeed, they have enormous founts. And you see here is probably, you, you have the oldest bridge, Roman bridge, the oldest bridge still working in Spain, the Roman bridge. And then my approach, as I say, was first of all being uh, very much, uh, and this is interesting, you know, because it fits very well with the thing of the violin or of the cello I showed before, you know, they are also aspects in a bridge who, without being any contradiction, in contradiction with his uh, pure technical nature, can introduce certain elements who are uh, uh, visible and uh, that people can realize and has to do in, uh, uh, and transport you in a different context, which it is the context of, for example, you know, the context of the repetitions of the arc, the many arc with the very big arc of the bridge, the bridge who is very transparent, you see, so making the, even if the, the, the bridge basically was, has had to be built in, in concrete, but the top of the arc was done as a, as a framework. Uh, or, or as a, a truss, you see, in order to become transparent and in a way, you know, fits uh, gently with the hills in the background. Here you see also from other uh, point of view, the big arc behind and the Roman uh, bridge in front of it. Here another view of the correlation between the two parts. And here during uh, construction in this case. Here the bridge itself. Here the cross section. As I say, you see, even approaching the problem, you see, in, in these two, I think in this case also in a very traditional manner, because it's very easy, you see, if you are confronted to the Roman, probably among, uh, technically, the Romans, who was a very pragmatic, uh, uh, has had a very pragmatic understanding of engineering and deliver us works that uh, they learn us what means firmitas. Firmitas, uh, 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 that they say as an attribute, was not only, and I want to insist about that, they was not only firmity, they was also perennity. They have done works that still 2,000 years after that they are there. Who is very interesting also, you see, just as an idea that I put here in the room, who is very important to reflect about, that they understood the amortisement of those uh, 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 constructions not over one generation, even over two generations. They understood it almost, you see, until our time. So those bridges have been even very, uh, being very expensive and very uh, difficult to build at the time. 
they have been enormous rentable because still today some of them you know are still serving which it is a great a great thing and should also help us to understand that uh, uh, buildings they bring very much supporters of the memory and that they are also part of an heritage that we are giving to the next generations here some views you see entering into the bridge you see also um, interesting is as i say you see uh, uh, when i show you those drawings of the views of the bridges from down below and i underline the spatial effect of the bridges so a bridge can be also crossing it can be you will say erlebnis is a, a, una vivencia you will go across and have an experience you, you experience a bridge so as i say before you approach it like that and, in a, 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 and suddenly you are in this other space with different... I mean, it's very modest what they can do, you know. It's not that they will amaze you or something like that, you know. It's not a, like getting in a disco or something with a lot of lights and things. But it's, it's just in a very subtle way, you see, you can also introduce patterns of movement and uh, experiences, you see, by crossing these 600 meters or almost, you know, from one side to another, which it is a long way, you see, and it is the same city. So by subdividing the bridge and creating this kind of... of uh, uh, vivencia, as I say, or experience, you see, the people get a little bit distracted and make the uh, pass through, you see, in a more... Uh, 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 also important is the fact of privileging the pedestrian. Myself, I am an, uh, an eternal pedestrian. I don't drive. So, uh, 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 so I think pedestrians are very important and we have to uh, 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 signify that. Sometimes, you see, you have... I show you, let's say, a heroic landscape. Now I will show you a landscape of every day every day. Our cities are full of these kind of things, you know. It is the arrival of the North train lines into the city of Barcelona, who is, um, in my opinion, one of the very, very beautiful cities. I don't want to say the most beautiful, because people... <laughs> but a very beautiful city of the <laughs> Mediterranean. And you see, they have, it has part like this, in which the trains arrive all together, enter in a tunnel, and um, you see, we have had to build, and it was my first built bridge, because that I have a very special relation to it, uh, uh, you see, to, to build a bridge to link, uh, to link two parts of the city who has been uh, since ever uh, uh, separated. So that's also very important. You see, the, the bridges, they can repair cities in a very efficient manner. They can also generate cities. Think about the Brooklyn, you see, was built, and Brooklyn didn't exist. So all what this bridge has done, you know, to the construction of, uh, or, or, uh, and, and the generation of the city of, of Brooklyn. So even if they seem to be very modest items, you see, in the everyday life, even when the Romans arrive into a place, they set a camp in the, in, in the border of a river, all the, except Madrid, but the major part of the European capital are, uh, who are Roman foundation are built. Madrid is not a Roman foundation, but those who are, they are built on rivers, you see, on rivers. So they set a camp, Lutetia, Paris, you see, then they built a bridge, the camp used to protect the, uh, the bridge and the river itself protect the camp and then generate, you see, the city around. So in the origin of many cities, you see, is uh, uh, the bridge part of it. And because that, in my opinion, they are so genuinely uh, 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 real uh, city generation, uh, generators and urban context uh, generators. So here, you see, even at the time, you know, now there is a park built on both sides of the of the tracks, you see, but we try, you see, to link the pedestrians to the middle, to privilege the pedestrian in this kind of balconies, and work with concrete and steel uh, in order to recreate, uh, uh, you see here, this is the, the, the two balconies with the traffic uh, uh, getting across. Here, some details. It's interesting also this point, you know, sometimes, and in another way, you see, uh, things appear in a design. And uh, as I say, by drawing the ellipse in the first bridge, there was the beginning of the thought, bringing the forces overhead, bringing the tensions overhead. By leaning this arc here, in order to emphasize the shape and stabilize the other more important arc, who is the vertical one, it appears a new vocabulary, which it is why arcs has to be vertical. Do you understand? That's the question. Why arcs? It's just a question. You could say, why an arc has to be vertical? It's not, I mean, uh, mm, Apparently, it's, it's logic, isn't it? And the bridge in Merida follows this logic. You know, it's a central arc who is vertical. The bridge in Merida has an, uh, an enormous cross-section in order to stabilize the arc against buckling, you see, because it's free. Here, indeed, I built an inclined arc 
who is supporting the vertical one and creating a core structure who stabilizes the vertical one, who is the most porting. It doesn't mean that the inclined one is not porting. You see well the cables here. So a new, uh, like a spark, you see a new way appears. You see here, as I say, emphasizing the idea of the balcony. Also interesting, I spoke before about the pedestrians crossing a bridge. Usually a bridge is a link. In our mind, however, remains very often as a place. So I thought, you see, a, a bridge can be effectively a place where people can maybe sit there for a while, you know, because it's nice. I mean, if you have been in cities like Venice, you see, there's no doubt in Prague, there's no doubt that bridges can be a place uh, because people even walk uh, across uh, and promenade. So very important also uh, in the nature of, of the object, you see, to uh, re re revalorize, you know, those aspects. Uh, just uh, about the inclined arc, uh, arch, uh, in other uh, cases, I went effectively into the analysis of this inclined arc until letting the arc uh, completely free, until making from the inclined arc almost the essence of, uh, of the statical nature of the bridge by using something also who is unusual in the uh, pure engineering approach of a problem. You see, uh, mostly, uh, just to conclude the, the previous chapter, when you take a book of, uh, uh, or, or you get in a lecture of, of uh, statics, you see, then you will learn about bending moments, about shear forces, about normal forces, and then almost at the end, you learn about torsion. Of course, you know, <laughs> people say it's not important because it's at the end. But on the other side, all our bones, you know, who are porting vertical forces are hollow. And they are also torsional stiff. So the torsional forces are very active in the nature. And you see, by working with the inclined arc, and by this idea of saying, is it possible to do an inclined arc? And make, you know, work on a structure of a major dimension, let's say 250 meters span, you know, carrying uh, uh, four lines of traffic and pedestrians. You see, is it possible to do that by using simply an inclined arc out of the plan of the vertical, of the gravitatorial uh, weight? And uh, the conclusion is yes, by using the torsion of the deck. By using the torsion of the deck. So the major part of sections built in engineering, you see, who are hollow sections, as I show in this traditional section, they have an enormous torsional stiffness who get not, uh, not used. Do you understand? They, they, they could hold forever, you see, torsionally. But since they are done as boxes, because they work better, they stabilize each other, and so they also are torsional stiff. Uh, and uh, and uh, by using this trick of uh, uh, using regular sections who are torsional stiff and activating the torsional, uh, uh, let's say, stiffness or resistance of those sections, uh, you could arrive to get from the bridge of Merida inclining it, and since you incline it, you see, then you have it in the center of, of the deck, so you are disturbing the traffic. Uh, uh, so you take the, the, the arc and, the, and you put it on one side, which it is really almost breaking all the rules. <laughs> of the, it's almost, uh, 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 let's say, it's uh, almost, uh, 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 you go, uh, uh, you transport yourself in the field in which, in the eyes of many people, you are, uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, breaking, uh, let's say, breaking all the rules. You know, you are uh, 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 not, not, not only an iconoclast, but it's also very easy to, to uh, 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 you put you out, let's say, of the... But it's also an interesting, it's an interesting field, because I think, finally, you see, is that a matter of economy? You can, can you justify that by an economic uh, criteria? Uh, uh, can you justify that? Uh, then you see also how relative those criteria are because uh, economic, is, it means uh, simply the order of the house. It doesn't mean cheap. Economic means economos. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, finally, what you are is uh, moving into a terrain in which maybe for the particular orthodox bridge doesn't work, but it can help you very much if you are putting a lot of versatility in the approach to the city, in the approach to the place, in the functional versatility of, of making bridges in the curb, uh, supporting them on one side and not in both sides, making them even more transparent. So it delivers you, it enriches, finally, your vocabulary and uh, uh, brings you, uh, let's say, it delivers you more elements to work with.
let's say, this could be a justification. I, I think there are also many others, but uh, this is a good one. And here, you, uh, uh, coming into another, uh, uh, um, and this image here, once I have uh, uh, finished my, my uh, doctor thesis, I thought I have to uh, uh, frame the work uh, as uh, many people dedicate that to somebody or whatever. In my case, it was clearly, uh, you see, very uh, uh, close to my wife and my son, at the, uh, who was a little boy at the time, you see. But uh, what I thought is that, you see, I found this image in a book of my son who was a, a Walt Disney book called The Living Desert, a, 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 in which you see this flower who opens uh, 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 and you see the sunset behind and the, and the flower opens in the night. So it's a, a little bit, you know, to emphasize that uh, nature is much more clever, isn't it? But it doesn't, we don't need to be better as the nature because we selves are also part of the nature. Or because that I think I never, uh, in the admiration of, uh, of the nature and of the beauty of the nature, I follow very much the school of, of, uh, of painting, you see, of, uh, uh, in which um, uh, you see, uh, uh, say uh, something like that, that an apple of Cezanne, as soon as Cezanne painted an apple, is no more an apple. It's clear, you cannot eat it. It's something else. So it's just the reflect of the impression of an apple in a painting. And he effectively achieved, he say, je veux surprendre Paris avec une pomme. I want to surprise Paris with, uh, with an apple. You know, and indeed, it's, uh, with, with this modest object, uh, you can uh, really, with uh, having the talent of, of uh, Cezanne, you see, you can really achieve this wonderful thing. So this is the school I try to follow. It is an approach by watching nature and uh, by uh, uh, trying to get uh, as part of it. And uh, 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 indeed, the doctor thesis, uh, who is, uh, let's say, uh, is a, uh, you could say, is a very dry, uh, uh, thing, you see. Uh, um, however, um, um, brought me into a, a double world. One is the world of the rigor of uh, approaching uh, uh, a problem. So I want to, just for the students to tell an anecdote, is that that I went to um, a professor of the ATH, bringing him a program of all what I want to say. And this gentleman, after having read my program, he said, come, you should come one week uh, later. So I came there, and then he uh, took my program in hand and, say, and tell me, vous voulez inventer toute la mécanique, who means you want to invite it, all the mechanic, you know, which it is, <laughs> see, I understood that's, that's not uh, the, the way to do things, you have to focus on it. So I uh, uh, started focusing in the study of something I need now to draw in order to make it. So I discovered in uh, the table uh, of... Uh, 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 not in my house, but in the table of my mother-in-law, that she has had a share who was something like that. Getting through. And that she used to, to put it on the table, extend it, and put it on the table, and put hot things over there. So, and uh, it's also this uh, uh, type of things that uh, you get always corrected because you, you name things in hand and you started playing with them and then somebody says, stop it, you know, we are here <laughs> having lunch or dinner and you are playing with this thing. But indeed, uh, I thought, what an interesting uh, uh, thing and very simple pattern, isn't it, of the rhombus, of the rhombus, eh? let's say, uh, if I draw it, who can be deformated, you can... Indeed, you see, uh, by preserving the distances a a by ending uh, the uh, angle phi, you can get uh, shapes. Uh, who, indeed, in a, a planar world, you see, became one line. So I was, you see, in order to formulate it, uh, so I was confronted to a system of bars and uh, bars linked with each other that could uh, transform from a two-dimensional event you see, with uh, a development in two directions, into a, a linear event. And uh, it's very interesting because, in a way, you see, you can get from something who has two dimensions in something who has only one dimension. And I thought, that's not bad, you know, it's interesting. So uh, my approach 
uh, I started working on that and looking a little bit for literature, and I found, you see, that it could be put in a, in a, in a little bit more uh, rigorous frame by studying the degrees of freedom, you know, and uh, approaching, you see, in terms of uh, the stability that I knew before from the previous study in, in mechanics. So, uh, so I started counting, you know, by having a certain number of bars, how many uh, uh, articulations I can take apart and still the system works and things like that. So it was a very simple uh, uh, approach, as uh, you can uh, see here. Then, getting out of it, I thought, but indeed, if you are thinking in, in a planar structure, imagine now, you see, we are in the space, and then you have one plan, you have one planar structure in that direction, and let's say another planar structure in the other direction. So you can work, you can move your system in that and in that direction, and still, you see, you have a kind of almost like a, a let's say, a tetrahedra. You see, but without those boundaries here. And then you can get from uh, uh, um, virtually a spatial element into a linear element. So it was interesting here, two dimensions getting into one, here, three dimensions already getting into one. And uh, it was just a, a, a reproduction of that here. I could also constatate that you could do that not only by using two orthogonal plans, you can do that also by using three plans and even more. So the complexity was increasing and also something interesting was the fact that those shapes you are seeing, they are all, as this here, you see per nature, you can put them in a grid and then do many of them. The same thing happens here. You can also link those, you see, with others and create real spatial frames who develop in the plan also in the other dimension and have almost a structure that you can pull out in two directions, you see, as an spatial body because it has a, a depth and it has two other dimensions. And then by pulling it together, it comes into a line. So there was small steps into, let's say, a chain of events uh, uh, getting ahead uh, uh, in this uh, world of, of uh, let's say, of, uh, of uh, not yet, because, you see, I was not thinking in a particular type of structures, even, indeed, in the whole thesis, you know, there is not an approach, you know, to a particular, except at the very end, I make reference, you know, to possible uh, 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 pragmatic uh, approaches to them. But then, also, you see, I, until now, uh, uh, this, what I show you, was given by this fact of the rhomboidal form. But then I put me the question, because I draw you also the, uh, the, the octahedra. You see, I thought, however, you see, the octahedra is, by its, uh, being all triangulated, is a stiff shape. But I thought, is it not possible to get, not from a planar pattern, you know, as a basic pattern, is not possible to go from a spatial pattern? From a, a pure, and so I, dis, I, 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 let's say, I want to use this word, you know, I discover, you understand, it's a, a strange word, but is it really, I didn't hear about that before. You see, that if you take a cubus, you see, this is a cubus, put over a diagonal, you don't have boundaries, you see, they are not horizontal, horizontal elements who are bounding it. So this is just in order that, because maybe my drawing is not very clear. You see, putting it on a, a diagonal, you can push this diagonal. Here in the octahedra, you can do that because uh, it's indeformable, you know, there, there is bounded. But in the cubes, not. There is no link here. And what it happens, it is your cubus started getting a bit more uh, shape like that. You see, it becomes, it goes flatter. And at the end, even it becomes a plane. You understand? 
it becomes a plane. So it becomes, you see, the projection of the cubus is, let's say, in this case, is an hexagon, you see, with, let's say, like this, like that. And at the end, you see, you started, let's say, in a projection with an hexagon who is like this, and concludes with an hexagon who is like that, in which the A is equal to the length of the side. So, so you get the cubus flat. It was, for me, it was, a, a, let's say, a step forward. I say, from three dimensions, I was stepping back, you know, from three dimensions into two dimensions. You see, and by a coherent uh, uh, topological transformation of the whole thing, because you have the cube, you press it down, this becomes more and more an hexagon, and at the end, you have an hexagon on the, on the table. Now, then you see, I thought, it's not possible to go from these two into one. And there is a trick to do that. <laughs> it is possible, it's a, it's a trick, it's really, it's, you see my fingers, my finger. These are the three core, uh, the three uh, 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 sides of the cube, and the three lower sides of the cube. So they have been put together like this. You see, they are put together flat. Now the trick is that here. You see, so those corners who was in the middle, in the low middle, now they goes up, and those who was in the upper, they goes down. And then they separate together, and effectively you get one line. And this is mathematical. You can uh, effectively, you know, control all the. I am explaining that in words, but it's really, you see, it's, it's interesting. Also, it could be maybe more brilliant, you know, to start it here, uh, making whatever a mathematical formula. But you see, I'm not good enough to do that. So I, I prefer just to deliver you the pure way, the, the pure and rough approach, you see, into the problem. So uh, I think this was an enormous uh, 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 step because I was confronted to a, a polyedra, a platonic body, who was from a three-dimensional uh, body through a three-dimensional transformation, uh, transformable in a, in, a, in a flat, in a two-dimensional body. And this two-dimensional by another complementary, uh, complementary, I say, uh, transformation, because it is, uh, you see, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, to go back, you see, into, uh, through a, a complementary transformation getting into a, a, a linear transformation. Um, so, uh, you, if you think like that, you know how many matter is done, you see, in a cubic system, you know, the galena, you see, I mean, the, the uh, 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 crystals in the nature, you know, what? if we could shrink them, we could make them disappear. You understand? So, from, <laughs> you see, we could, them, because the one-dimensional is invisible, isn't it? The four-dimensional, you see, I mean, I say that, you know, because there is a lot of, it's a very fascinating uh, 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 understanding of, of the approach by getting out that, indeed, if you look in and deep, deep in the nature, almost, you see our crystals, you know, or our crystals, or our, uh, 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 let's say, in this or that particular um, crystallographical system. Then the same thing happens with another figure. I hear yesterday speak about, and it was the rombo do decaedra. The rombo do decaedra permits you to do, I mean, they may maybe give many of them, you know, but in the rombo do decaedra, I arrive also to this conclusion. And uh, uh, you see, it's a bit more difficult to, <laughs> to draw it for you. In order that you understand, the approach could be like that, you know, it's better so that you understand it. You see, you have a, an octaedra I spoke about. You cut the corners of the octaedra. You cut the corners of the octaedra all the points. And then you became a shape, if we continue, you see who is all done, is all done by a, a rhomboidal, I mean, you get a series of rhomboidal forms like this, what I am drawing now. Well, whatever. The fact it is that this rhombo de decaedra delivers you a projection who is an square, like that. And by fixing those points, you can, again, develop those corners up in a shape who appears to be something like that.
And these points getting up and those getting down, you can relocate all those things in a line, in a line. Interesting from both cases it is that the one is an hexagon, the cubic one. So you can create nets as an hexagon. And this here is an square. So you can create nets as an square. So it was the beginning of an approach, you see, to uh, uh, a more uh, um, large field in which you can add those pieces one to the other. So I thought I will take a particular field and look if it is possible to generate with that not flat composition, but polyedrical compositions. And signs, you see, squares and hexagons are elements in which you can decompose, uh, for example, an sphere. Eh? So you, uh, I was thinking that uh, uh, an interesting approach could be just to take certain type of polyedra in which you have squares and hexagons. You see, working together, like I draw here. You see, and just incorporate those principles I say before from squares and hexagon and generate a spherical polyedras, not platonic, but spherical polyedras that can also collapse, which I have demonstrated in several of the models I built with a lot of patients because it was quite a hard, uh, <laughs> a very interesting and very... Uh, uh, but, you know, finally, uh, you see, uh, what I want to say uh, is that here, uh, that um, um, step by step, isn't it, uh, starting with the observation of this rhombus and making from a planar figure a linear one, getting into the polyedras that can be uh, folded as the rhombododecaedra and the cubus and incorporating that in more complex geometries, uh, um, you see you can arrive, uh, let's say, to the trunk uh, icosaedra, who delivers you a very beautiful, almost like a football uh, 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 ball or other ones, you know, in which you can incorporate these principles and make them collapsible and make them that they became, you know, from an spherical uh, 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 entity into a linear one. So, you see, uh, in extension, I try to delimitate the principles and the rules, you see, to do that in a very uh, free manner, as it is, for example, you know, using trapezoidal forms and other forms. And uh, uh, I think, you know, looking back, you know, in a certain moment, you have to conclude the, uh, uh, these, uh, these things and deliver it as a work. But I remember this time with a lot of nostalgia. And uh, I think, you know, the experience, this um, very, I mean, in my case, a very modest experience to, as I say, you know, watching a cube and seeing that you can fold it together. Or, uh, you see, it, it delivers you such an emotion that I can understand very well the people who has dedicated and devoted all his life and energies, you know, to work in those fields. So this is... Uh... Well, I think this is a very complicated problem, but in the end, uh, it is much simpler it appears. Let's start from the end. What does one achieve? Or from the beginning, why all that? The fundamental thing, if I'm not mistaken, that bothered you is why should buildings stand immobile? Why shouldn't they be folding and being constantly transformed? Okay. Then we want to approach that rigorously exactly as we make bridges and the other structural elements of the building. So what do we do? Back to Descartes, we reduce the problem. And the problem is reduced to two things. You have those lines, those vertices, and you have those joints. And then you go step by step building the universe of, you populate the universe, I should say, by creations of this type. So I'm not going to repeat the various routines through which more and more and more shapes are generated. And then something fascinating happens. You say, well, if I do that, very large number of cases, I can imagine that I have described the universe. That is, I have 
back to the rationalist, to Leibniz, I started enumerating all possibilities and then solving a problem is no more an invention, it is a discovery. Because all the solutions are here, I have generated them exhaustively, rigorously, and then the only thing I have to do is to match, given a constraint, given a kind of opening I have, given a kind of performance of folding I would like to have, match it to the solution. So I go back and pick it up. The problem becomes, or rather the, the thesis becomes even more fascinating in its implications. In a way, this is a kind of fantasy we have post-thesis. The implications are even more intriguing because think about the most elementary structure of this type, which is one fixed joint and a road that goes around on a surface. What do you get? You get a circle. You have a very elementary compass. Think all of a sudden some of those extremely complicated structures going up in shape and folding. As they fold, they constitute a very complicated system of compasses this is, if I'm not mistaken, it was Courant who talked about this new structure, which is a spatial compass, inside which you nest compasses and so on, through which, again, you can generate any possible curvature. Now, I would like to show, if you permit me, an illustration of a possible machine of the time of Leibniz, of this kind. This is described not by Leibniz. It is a caricature of the thinking of Leibniz. This is in an ideal place, an academy of very wise people who work for eight hours, something like that, and the rest of the time they have a good time in the academy, drinking and singing and so on. But the eight hours they work, they work very rigorously. They have this machine and they rotate it, and through that, they write all the masterpieces of literature, science, fiction, anything you can imagine. So it is, that was Swift who developed this kind of uh, caricature idea. But then you say, why not? Why it is not possible out of a mechanism like the one Santiago developed, indeed create a generative machine of any possible building. Now, I would like you very much to show us some of the projects that come out of the thesis, but not rigorously. In other words, after doing all this work, which is not, first of all, it is not as complete as I present it, because the computational aspects to make it complete would be extremely difficult. But even when we look at the work which, was, which followed this thesis, we see very clearly that somewhere here the system operated, making, again, possible all those unprecedented, impossible shapes that one feels they were created out of whimsy and pure fantasy. So let's go back to the very beginning. You saw how systematically by adding why not questions about the form of an unknown object, you can step by step grow and arrive to unprecedented solutions. You can look at the problem not only from the, problem, from the point of view of stability and uh, uh, economy of materials, but you have already, 
already hinted it from the point of view of integration in the landscape, from the point of view of amortization, from the point of view of how this building is going to, this structure is going to behave with bad uh, conditions. What I'm trying to say is you put more and more and more dimensions in this universe of the problem. Now, going back, we're going to have a glance of what followed the thesis, which owes to the thesis, but is not generated rigorously out of it. I would say loosely and through an inspiration, which is the question mark of our next meeting. Would you like to show yes. some of those yes. bridges? Uh, you will see some of the sketches I have done in hand, also now in the I, I would projection. suggest that we, we, yes, jump, I will go just, we uh, jump the thesis, yes, we do it yes, very but, quickly. Uh, I will, yeah. you see, these are elements I try to uh, uh, draw for you before. Here you have those compasses I mentioned before, just in a very rudimentary way. And uh, you see here one of those uh, uh, models. But now you see uh, uh, interesting is the, uh, the approach into uh, surfaces and into this is a facade done for uh, a fabric in northern Germany uh, with the uh, gates, who, as you can see, open. So the idea of movement uh, you see in the pieces before find applications. Uh, also the idea of, for example, here you see by working with several materials, you see one, and creating a seriality of the fact of, you see here is corrugated metal flat, corrugated metal on the side, ondulated, and here you see the doors uh, done also in aluminum, getting into the rigor of having to design the hinges and making it also for a price, because as you can imagine, to build that uh, uh, was, uh, you see, this was a, a conventional warehouse, and this is the entry of the lorry, the, where, where the lorry entries into, uh, uh, enter every day and goes out into the warehouse. Here also another project is an historical building at the Reichstag. I was part of the competition and I was also, I win the competition ex equo with other two architects with this proposition who was, who consists in building a cupola over the roof of the uh, building. Uh, and the cupola uh, uh, has to do very much with the studies I show you. Indeed, I wanted that the cupola of open in order uh, to ventilate the space, you know, by the hot debates, you know, in order that the uh, steam can go out. This is the aula. <laughs> and here the cross-section, you see the uh, parliament down below and the cupola overhead. Built, as I, I tell you, according to the principles, or at least, you know, projected according to the principles you saw in the previous uh, schemes. Here in the night, you see the four parts. And here, uh, in, a, in, a, in a place in, uh, in my uh, region, uh, in um, Alcoy, in Valencia, uh, where I come from. I mean, I don't come from Alcoy, I come from Valencia, but uh, <laughs> I could also be from Alcoy, because it's <laughs> very, very familiar uh, to us. You see, also interesting to see the cupolas here, who are all uh, done in blue, uh, with the ceramics. And you see uh, the, the, the plaza you saw before. You see, for example, this is part of the plaza. Uh, the, there is a festival there once a year, and then we have to remove the lamps and close the doors of the entrance into the... This is the city hall on one side, and you, my left-hand side, uh, there is the city hall, and the plaza itself can open, you see, uh, using this mechanism. This is the fountain also, who became part of the plaza, and who also can open, as you see there, so that people can walk over, you see, and when the festival arrives. So it's interesting also to underline that the first experience in movable construction has been done in very modest places. It's very good because you are out of the observation of all those critics who may maybe say, I don't like arcs who are inclined and things like that. So thanks God, there are places like Alcoy in which you can uh, do this uh, kind of things without getting too much. Here are also, it's interesting, the interior of the plaza uh, has a single pattern. It's a parabolical arc and the intersection of two parabolical arcs together generate the interior, uh, the interior space is only a single element, you see, who generate this space here. Getting from one and finishing in two, because if you remember, the plaza is also trapezoidal. So we could do in the underground of the plaza by using even daily light. You see how important is the daily light entering in. The patterns you see of the light are natural light, even if we are in an underground, so the people doesn't get the feeling they are in the underground. 
And what it is interesting is this uh, uh, systematic of getting out of one arc and finishing by two arcs. The intersection generates a half longitudinal arc, who is also porting in the longitudinal sense. You see it and the and the limitate the spine. You see it here, two, one arc on one side, two arcs on the other. It's like my fingers, you see they are, or my, my hands, you see progressing, they move and intercept in the middle and generate at the end uh, a double arc. Here also another example, this is done for the university in Zurich. I have built in a pre-existing uh, building in the campus of the university by refurbishing uh, the building, the new law faculty or law seminar, and also the library. The library, it, it is situated in a, co a courtyard at the interior. You see here the cupola, who is bringing light at the interior of the space. Uh, you see here the campus. However, you see we are very close to the central building. The central building is just uh, on the right-hand side of the uh, old chemistry building. Here you see the plan with the courtyard and the implementation of the reading rooms. Uh, I wanted to deliver, uh, to do a scheme very simple in which people have the access to the book and on the other side people are sitting in this courtyard in a kind of balconies, uh, emphasizing very much the, the privacy and the character, the individual character of reading. However, in the upper part there are seminar rooms and parlatoria in which people can meet together. These are some views of the balconies who are heavily uh, acoustically insulated so that uh, the noises get absorbed and because that we use wood in the, in the balconies. You see here also looking it from the front, the bookshelf behind and the tables in the, uh, you see it here also a little bit from the top. The roof, as you see, this is a photo in the night, but there is a roof who is retractable and covers it and control the light at the interior. Here you see also the tables, how they work. People can work individually in those tables, but they can establish eye contact. I, I thought it was a very important thing since I met my wife as a student uh, of uh, jurisprudence. So I think you may maybe study very much, but you have time. <laughs> you need to. <laughs> you see here the roof also over there who opens a little bit more open, you know. It's also an acoustical, very active element because uh, it is done all by, by uh, panels uh, who are uh, acoustically absorbing. So wherever we put absorbing material, we put it in order to avoid carpet, because uh, uh, you see, so the, the, the soil is a, a parquet and, and it's all wood uh, mostly, and, and a steel construction. You see here also uh, some uh, views of the roof when it is all this folded, and here uh, some images uh, of and here, uh, because they, they are not exactly ellipses, you see, are pseudo ellipses, they are a little bit bigger one from the other when you look from down below. So present the, the uh, library to the incoming student. You don't see anybody, it's like the library was there for yourself, only for you. Here, another building who is, uh, this is a winery. <laughs> it's also interesting because the geometrical pattern of the roof, done in aluminum, and uh, one of the biggest problems here was to mash in this very beautiful landscape, isn't it? It, it, it was, uh, uh, I was afraid uh, uh, of, uh, of the fact of building, and so I played the, the card of the colors and the material, the aluminum, who, who is similar to the rocks over there, and the, the, the hilly landscape mimetized by the curves of the sinusoid curves, Sinusoid in, in the plan of the roof, but sinusoid also in the elevation of the walls. So the walls are very thin, but very stiff because they are built over a, a linear... Uh, there is, uh, you see here, the, uh, just one facade could be clad in wood, which it is the, the parade facade where you arrive, the back is in uh, rock, uh, rough concrete. Here the interior, also some interesting thing is that it has been done with a single beam. There is one measure of beam who moves in a double sinusoid complementary from one side to another. So it gains very much to do. Here also a parabolic arc that by repetition and putting it, uh, you see, generate this agora for the Athens Olympic Games. Uh, interesting also because it is not only, you see, just the complexity is reached not by the choice of the form, who is a single form, but by moving it in plan, you know, by moving it in plan in a kind of ellipse surrounding all the area. So you, it delivers you a lot of perspectives and uh, the transparency of, of the structure because there is no glass there, it's just to produce shadow. And indeed, you see, by taking away, let's say, 40% of the sun radiation, you get a very comfortable situation at the interior. You see here also how it turned, following in a way the example of Israel, planting trees. We plant 3,000 trees and half a million bushes. It was a, a one of, in my opinion, one of the most gratifying things of the whole exercise was this enormous effort we have done to put water and plants there who are growing uh, happily. Here you see the interior. 
here the fountains. Also, you see, mashing with the idea of the arcs. When you approach uh, uh, Greece, just to put, put you in another context, you think, you know, all is classical. It's not true. There is also the Byzantine, you know, the Byzantine. I mean, the Byzantine was probably the most arduous and, and daring, bold, and art contract, uh, constructor of the history of the architecture, isn't it? Here uh, is like the roof of the bodegas, but in vertical. And it is an element that in the morning gets sun, you see, frontally. In the afternoon, it, uh, after three o'clock, delivers shadow in the hallway approaching to the main stadium. So the shadow of this element, 25 meters uh, high, who hits also some pre-existing buildings, who was, uh, I thought it was better to hit them. So uh, it delivers also a long way of shadow getting into the stadium where people move. Uh, you see here some elements. It's done all by the repetition of bars in the sinusoidal form, as you saw, it's very high, it's almost uh, 30 meters high, and length 250 meters. And then you see it here, and uh, it moves, isn't it? It moves uh, subtly, you see, uh, it's motorized, and like a kinetic sculpture along these 250 meters moves, which in the night, uh, you see how it looks by the light, but it was also very nice to see walking it during the day, because the shadow moves also. So you was walking and moving shadows, so you get a little bit the impression to get in a forest in which the sun is getting through and the branches are, are moving or something like that. See, it's also a, very, it's a beautiful perception of all those bars and the border of the bars moving along in the border of the, uh, of the way getting into the stadium. In a way, what you heard today ended up into a paradox and a contradiction. Uh, you heard all this building up about mathematics, geometry, combinatorics, and so on. And then Santiago opened all those gates to very mysterious forms, emotions, and so on. Still, I will insist, let's go to the basics, to the beginning. Suppose creativity is not invention, it is discovery. Suppose we are able to identify all possible solutions. And it will be like, you know, having, this is some of you who are in operations research and so on, might know my joke, but then you have to be patient with me. It's like having a landscape with contours and the top which is populated very thickly by trees. The problem is not to design a building. It's much simpler to arrive at the top. The cart will say, well, first, you have to define what is the top. Definition of the top, wherever you look, you go down. OK. Second, you have to develop a rational, way through which alternatives, that's Leibniz now, are enumeratable. So the rational way is to say, I plot all those points exhaustively. And then a procedure. What's my search procedure? I have to be very rigorous, very rational. I have all the possibilities. All buildings of the world are here. I simply have to discover which is the appropriate one given the program and the requirements. So I start from here and I go, 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 go. And then I turn. And I keep on doing that till I arrive, I keep on checking. Can I keep on ascending? Yes. And I keep on moving on and on and on and on. And maybe at a certain moment, I arrive at the top. It sounds wonderful, but it sounds totally absurd, like the machine that uh, Swift was uh, describing in this ideal academy. Why is it absurd? Because we are human beings and we are material. In order to be able to do that, we need energy, first of all, to keep on moving. If it was a machine, the machine needs energy. We need time. And uh, 
both, not to mention other things, we need some memory to keep track of what we are doing. All those things are finite. And even with the greatest imaginable breakthroughs in our computational uh, discoveries, we are not able to cover something like your thesis was proposing as a generative machine of all possible solutions which can identify the best by simply matching requirements to one of those possibilities. So one idea, it's not mine, it's called hill, hill climbing, but will give you a hint is I start randomly, I keep on going, I ascend, I ascend, I ascend. Well, I descend, I change direction randomly. I ascend, I ascend, I ascend, I descend. I change direction randomly and uh, I change it again and again and again. And you can see how quickly I arrive at the top. But even under those circumstances of clever shortcuts, heuristics, as the engineers call it, still it is very easy to show you how it is not possible with real constraints to create a creative procedure as the one implied by this very ingenious conception of Santiago. Then, solution, we throw everything away. Not convincing, because if you look at the projects of Santiago that followed the thesis, somewhere you have the echoes, if not the guiding voices which led him to all those fascinating solutions. So what do we do? Now let me identify also another very vicious problem if we proceed purely analytically, quote-unquote, whatever that means, you know, as I described analysis up to now. I have to make also a sketch myself, more pictorial. You know, you have a beautiful landscape, and here is the top, and here are the trees. And uh, either through the stupid way or through the clever way, you climb up at the top. But there are vicious situations whereby you have other hills in this same area. And according to the procedure I described, once you arrive here, you are trapped. And you have seen that, most of you who are designers, either in engineering or in architecture, what a terrible trap is to arrive at a point whereby you, get, you cannot get out of it. And whatever rigor you apply, you are trapped. So in a way, what we would like to do is to be able to jump, to have overviews and jump. How can this be done? Possibly, this is what will explain the projects you saw following the thesis. In order to get this answer, you have to come tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>